Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's DAS webinar, Taking It Mainstream, How to Make Crypto Finance and Stable Coins Ubiquitous. Today's episode is made possible by Circle. I'd like to invite our speakers to unmute their lines and turn on video. During the webinar, please submit your questions to our speakers through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We'll save some time at the end of the discussion to answer these. The session will be available on demand. All registrants will receive an email once the recording is live. I'd now like to turn the event over to BlockWorks Group co-founder, Mike Ippolito. Mike, please go ahead. Awesome, thanks for the intro, Julie. Um, lots of webinars these days, but I definitely feel confident in saying that we have the best intro music of, uh, of all of them. So uh, that is all Julie Miroff. She, she DJs at a warehouse on the weekends. So uh, if you're interested, go check her out. Um, awesome, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Jeremy and Pomp, for joining us today. And thanks to everyone who's, who's signed on and listening. Um, just to, you know, as Julie mentioned, this session is made possible by Circle. Uh, I think most of you probably know who they are and kind of what they do, but just as a quick shout out, um, you know, they're the best platform to run an internet business. Uh, we're going to be talking about everything that they do and how they're enabling uh, kind of the new wave of commerce in the crypto space uh, in this webinar. Um, but before we get started here, I think uh, most of you probably know these two folks who have got on. Uh, but if we could just do a quick round of intros before we get into all things stablecoin. Uh, Jeremy, I'll, I'll call on you to be brave and go first. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, Jeremy Lair, founder and uh, CEO of Circle. Um, I founded Circle uh, about seven years ago um, in the kind of earlier days of crypto. Um, but I've spent my career building kind of internet technology platform businesses in multiple generations of the internet, starting in the early '90s and um, and sort of evolving into this uh, Web 3.0. Decentralized uh, finance and decentralized internet era with with, with blockchain. So, uh, really excited about what's going on and excited to talk today. What's going on, guys? Anthony Pompliano. Um, I pretty much spend all my time either uh, building companies or investing in them um, in the crypto space. Uh, run a podcast or host a podcast, I guess. Uh, write a daily letter, um, and then also. Uh, Managed about $130 million or so uh, for institutional investors, everyone from public pensions to uh, university endowments, hospital systems, insurance companies, and uh, college endowments. All right, thanks, guys. Uh, excited to get into kind of the topic of today, which is uh, stable coins. Uh, I think we both want to kind of address, I mean, stable coins have kind of been one of the most interesting spaces in crypto this year. Uh, purely if you're, if you're looking at the growth of kind of the market cap. Uh, so I definitely want to kind of get into some of the, the macro issues and, and what's driven that growth, as well as kind of the more micro in terms of what's the actual customer demand that's driving that growth. So um, to just sort of, maybe let's just start broad here. Um, you know, the market cap of stable coins has gone up from around 6 billion at the beginning of this year to over 20 billion today. Uh, let's just start broad and talk about what is driving that growth. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's it's been it's been quite a year on that. I mean, I, I think there are a bunch of different dimensions to this. I think um, the the global macro backdrop obviously ha is a really critical one, and the global macro backdrop um, is, you know, sort of represents several things. So so one is um, there's sort of broader concern about monetary systems, and that's driving broader, um, you know, growth in crypto markets themselves. So stable coins were born out of crypto markets, uh, and they're like the, the, the dollar liquidity of, of crypto markets as well. And so to the degree that you have like a global macro theme of more people moving into things like Bitcoin or moving into more types of crypto assets, that's just an underlying driver. I think a second and related is, um, there, there's a lot of stress on, um, you know, on businesses globally, on uh, fisc, you know, on, on sovereigns in terms of their own uh, macroeconomic policy, fiscal policy. Uh, there's weakening of currencies all around the world, um, given the unprecedented amount of, of monetary intervention that's going on. We, we look at the U.S. and the several trillion dollars, but but this is this is not unique to the United States. It's happening all around the world, and that's driving more demand for digital dollars. So one of the, the big things that we've seen this year is um, a lot of international growth in people who want to hold digital dollar currencies, um, uh, you know, both as a, in, in a sense, as a, as a safe haven asset, like dollars as a safe haven asset, but with 
the utility value of the internet, right? A digital dollar um, that works on a blockchain, you can you know, transmit it and settle a transaction with someone in, in seconds very inexpensively. And so more people are getting exposed to that. And that I think kind of you know, leads to another macro theme here, which is basically um, we've seen this tremendous growth in DeFi uh, for lack of a better phrase, but basically the, the birth of um, what I like to think of as interest rate markets on the internet and, um, and, and borrowing and lending protocols on the internet and stable coins are the lifeblood of that. Um, you know, people want to borrow and lend in stable value. Um, and now anyone in the world can participate in those protocols. And, and so that's been a, a huge driver when, when you look at it as well. And there, there are many other themes. We're just seeing more and more people who are discovering the utility value for payments. And so we've seen this you know, growth in uh, businesses and individual uh, firms who are saying, I want to receive a payment with this. I'm going to make a payment with this. So we're graduating from just a crypto markets function and into a payments and settlements function as well. So the macro thing is pretty interesting, Palm. I, I know you spend a lot of time on the macro and you talk a lot about uh, kind of governments, um, you know, devaluing currencies through printing. Can you just, um, you know, anything to add to what Jeremy said kind of about the macro drivers of uh, stablecoin adoption? Yeah, I think that there's um, a couple of pieces that are really interesting, right? So one is uh, the stable coins that we're talking about here are basically digital currency that's backed by a fiat currency, right? So the monetary policy of those are no different. It's basically changing the technology form factor. And so all of the macro uh, pros and cons uh, that exist with kind of your legacy uh, fiat currency are going to be um, also uh, in existence here. Um, I think that you know, there's kind of this raging debate right now of um, you've got a world where if somebody said to you five years ago, hey, the Federal Reserve is going to print, you know, three trillion, probably going to end up about five trillion by the end of the year uh, dollars, and they're going to increase their balance sheet by 75 to 125 percent, depending on how much they end up printing, uh, how much inflation would you see? Right. And it, and it would be a foregone conclusion that we'd have really, really high inflation in all these issues. Now, there's a really strong argument that one, the liquidity crisis that we saw earlier this year with the global uh, kind of economic shutdown uh, created this deflationary environment. And so um, as much as central banks have been kind of producing liquidity and injecting it into the market, um, the market's kind of been just soaking all of that up. Right? It was so deflationary that uh, we haven't seen kind of the official CPI metrics uh, explode. Now, Alongside that, you also get the argument of like, well, maybe the CPI metrics aren't necessarily the best measure of true inflation, right? And so if you look at some of the unofficial numbers, you know, there's things out there that say that we're at four or 5% inflation. I've literally seen things as high as if you look at like asset appreciation that could be in the 12 to 15% range. And so um, I think that you kind of get into this whole debate about like, well, what's the best measure of inflation? But then I think you can kind of even go a step further and say, well, now we've got a Federal Reserve that's saying, hey, we have a goal of getting to above 2% inflation for a persistent amount of time. Right now, what can they get there? What's that going to take? How long can they do that? Like, there's so many questions. Um, but I think just understanding, like, every single one of those macro questions that exist in the legacy world also exists in a fiat backed stablecoin world. Um, and so I think Jeremy's point about, you know, where are the advantages or where are the differences? It really comes down to what does the technology unlock? Right. So, like, to me, the biggest thing is the accessibility. Right. So, if you look at kind of the most extreme examples in the world, if you're in Venezuela, Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe, Iran, you know, a bunch of these places where um, either the currency has failed or the people are being cut off from the global financial system, they want dollars. The dollar is still kind of the most desired currency in the world. Um, the problem is, you know, take Venezuela, for example, it's either one hard to get because there's capital controls. Two, if you get it and you put it in your bank account, you're worried about the government or the bank taking it from you. Uh, and then three is it can actually be dangerous to get it on the black market or really, really expensive to get on the black market. And so, if there's a world where you can simply use an internet connection and you can get exposure to you know, a global superpowers fiat currency, whether that's the dollar, the renminbi, you know, whatever currency of your, your choice, that accessibility actually becomes a really, really big differentiator. So I always go to the example of, let's say you've got a world where China is able to digitize their currency um, over the US dollar, right? Uh, or before the US dollar, you have an accessibility advantage to that currency over the dollar. Now, I think what Circle and others have done with stable coins backing the dollars are saying, look, we don't need to wait for the US government to go ahead and actually digitize the dollar, right? We can provide that exposure through um, the technology and the digital currencies that we build. And so I think that's kind of our saving grace here is 
you know, the federal government's talking about digital dollar. I just don't see it coming down the pipe anytime soon. And so we need, um, you know, companies like Circle and others to go ahead and kind of accelerate this because we will fall very, very far behind. And the problem with currencies is when you fall behind, you actually lose out on the network effect and the adoption. And it's hard to kind of come back from that uh, if somebody's got a big head start on it. I mean, I, I think laddering off that, um, you know, I, a lot of people fail to, to realize like modern electronic money is not uh, is, is certainly in, in the Western and, and now pretty much the global financial system. It's the outgrowth of, of private sector led consortiums building standards for interoperability. And if you think about just the internet itself, it's a set of open intellectual property that's published uh, that anyone can implement. And it's a decentralized permissionless network. That is the internet itself. And you know the 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 growth of the standards that have given us essentially access to all the world's knowledge for free, the ability to instantly communicate with anyone anywhere for free, those open permissionless networks and standards, they're they're implemented by private sector companies. Um, there's not like a, a a single government or corporation that say runs the web. Um, and and in financial networks, it's it's actually a, a little bit different. But you know the first generation of electronic money. What we what we think of, which is a bank wire, um, you know that you know, that is essentially run by a consortium of private sector actors agreeing to a set of technical standards, messaging standards for for how to how to do that. The most common form of electronic money that we we all know today is the card networks, and the card networks are associations of member financial institutions that define a set of rules, define a set of standards, define define interoperability, so that. Anyone can interact with any person or business can interact with each other electronically. Um, that's electronic money. Now, the the federal government didn't say, wait, wait a minute, we ought to go and 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 build the card infrastructure ourselves. And I think when we get into digital currency, we're we're dealing with the exact same thing. And and even the global regulatory community, the Financial Stability Board, the G20, um, have basically said, look, global stablecoin arrangements. That's the phrase they use, GSAs. Um, which are arrangements uh, of, of, of regulated financial institutions that come together to define a set of standards for how to operationalize stablecoins safely, compliantly with full reserve. Those are a new part of the financial infrastructure of the world. And here's how we ought to treat them. And the G20 is welcoming them as long as they meet those, those expectations. So things like Center Consortium, Libra Association, others, in the next two to three years, these are gonna race ahead. There are gonna end up being hundreds of millions, if not billions of end users that are using fiat digital currency through these standards well before there's anything from uh, say the ECB or the Federal Reserve. And I think that's just consistent with how things have been built in, in, our, in our modern electronic money world. So maybe just kind of uniting what both of you guys are saying here. So. If the real difference uh, or one of the big advantages of stable coins is accessibility, what we're kind of talking about is a redesign in the fundamental architecture of money. So I think people hear this word like stable coins, think, okay, it's more accessible, it's programmable money, you kind of understand it on a high level, but people might not really understand why that works the way that it does. Yeah. Largely because I think people don't really realize what real currency is. You know, if you ask people, what is money? They're like, oh, this dollar is money, right? Mm -hmm. But really what money is, is the liability of central banks. That's right. right. So could one or both of you just kind of dive into what, what does the money system kind of look like today in terms of central bank liabilities that getting distributed by commercial banks? Yeah. And how do stable coins represent a complete reimagining of that architecture? Go ahead, yeah. Jeremy. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. I mean, I mean, look, you know, um, uh, as, as I like to say, the, the U.S. dollar, um, as we know it, uh, is a, uh, a SQL database on an Oracle machine running on the Sun Solaris uh, 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 set of hardware in a building in, in the federal government. That's actually what the U.S. dollar is. I met with the CIO of the Federal Reserve and I asked him, you know, is it a SQL database? What, what database? What, what, what is it? Right. So the dollar is, a, <laughs> is that. Now, th there are records of those that are um, electronic, uh, and that is you know, deposits that uh, commercial banks hold overnight or longer with the Federal Reserve. That is, that is you know, base money. Um, there are also records of that that happen to have serial numbers on them and, and are physical tokens. 
And the, there are about $500 billion of those physical tokens produced each year. Those are mostly $100 bills. The majority of those are shipped overseas and I don't know what they are used for. Um, but but that's, that's a product uh, of the central bank is the physical uh, incarnation of those records. But fundamentally, there's a record uh, of that base layer uh, of dollars, and you know when when the when the Fed uh, you know decides to um, you know in increase its balance sheet by uh, purchasing certain assets, you know if you're technical you'd understand this. They essentially are doing a SQL insert statement that says you know, create some new records worth three trillion dollars, and now we have those those exist now. And we can go buy assets in the market with them and quote unquote inject liquidity. But that base layer. Um, uh, exists as a set of records with the federal government. And, and, and there are certain permitted um, institutions who can access that um, and who can store records with the Fed. And that's commercial banks in the United States, um, just as an example, and commercial banks who hold cash, it's considered electronic cash, but who hold cash with the Federal Reserve. That is fully reserved, meaning if it's sitting in a Federal Reserve account, it's fully reserved. You're, you're not using it for anything else. Now, when that commercial bank wants to take that and create money, that's the next layer. So typically today, a, you know, a bank might say, have, let's just use a simple example, has a million dollars that have been deposited with that bank. Uh, they may decide to create money. So central banks actually um, create money, this base layer of money, but commercial banks create the next layer of money. So a commercial bank will say, you know what, I've got a million dollars. I'm basically going to wager that if I create ten more, uh, you know, ten million dollars more, and give that incremental, say, nine million dollars to to people who want to borrow it, that that I'll get paid back, and that's where interest rates, you know, come from for lent for loans, and um, and that's effectively this next layer of money, which is commercial bank money, which is uh, fractionally reserved and is created by banks, um, stable coins you know, by design are designed to be more like uh, liabilities of a central bank. They are not literally that today because the reserves that back, uh, say USDC, um, there are regulatory covenants uh, on what kind of, of, uh, of stored value can back those, right? So you're not, you know, doing risk taking with that. It's, it's not being loaned out multiple times. It's, uh, you know, typically in you know, things like short-term U.S. government treasuries uh, or, or kind of reserved uh, cash. And th those are, um, you know, those give it attributes so that it is like a central bank liability. It's like holding it with the Fed. It's not quite there. Eventually, I think stable coins will get there where uh, stable coin issuers, take Circle as an example, might have a, uh, an account with the Fed and, and hold funds there. But you know, fundamentally, that's what, what that is. And, you um, and then you've got all these different um, mechanisms to move those records around between different institutions, and and those mechanisms are, are uh, you know vary, but usually the the way that money moves electronically today, pre blockchain is, you know, if you're again if you're technical, you'll you'll understand this, but you know comma delimited text files that are pushed around uh, FTP servers, that's the electronic money system in, in the United States um, for the most part. Um, and, and what blockchains represent is a dramatically richer representation of, of, that, of that value, a tokenized, uh, cryptographically verifiable uh, version of a, of a dollar uh, that can then you know, run on a public protocol that can be transmitted at the speed of the internet, that can be, the transactions can be settled now with new blockchains and literally milliseconds, hundreds of milliseconds at a tiny fraction of a cent. And so you're, you're, you're seeing like a leapfrogging of the capabilities of what a dollar can even be. I, so, I think one of the easiest things just to add to that, uh, Jeremy, that I, I tell people, and it's like so simple that half the people are just like, that's dumb. And the other half of the people are like, well, I never thought about it that way, is I can't think of a single example where something that existed in the analog world was digitized and the digital version wasn't superior yeah. and larger, yeah. right? Yeah. Sure. And so I think that what you're basically highlighting is just this idea of um, there's almost three stages. There's like the physical dollar. So if I literally yeah. like have one in my wallet, obviously right. the electronic version can do things that that are yeah. better. Um, and I use electronic because it is yeah. more of like the legacy system that we have today. Oh, totally. And then there's this like digital system where it's going to run on these public blockchains that is even better than the electronic right. system. 
I think there's this big distinction. I love that. And I, I think there's this big distinction between like the, the things that run on the public internet versus sort of like privately controlled walled garden gatekeep things. And if you remember back from, you know, earlier, you know, activities on the internet as it, as it developed, you know, you know, the, the, the cable and satellite companies used to say, well, we have digital broadcast satellite and we have, you know, digital cable. Like that was what you bought. I'm buying digital, it's digital now. What that meant is that they were using zeros and ones, <laughs> you know, they were using, uh, you know, uh, you know, packet switching or whatever it was to, to actually deliver it. But it was still a closed system. It was still, you got to get a physical cable from a company or you got to get a, a satellite connected uh, to, to, to a closed network. And Netflix blew over that, you know, and, and similar services, iTunes, so many others, they went over the top. They essentially were services entirely implemented in software, entirely implemented on the open public internet that anyone could connect to. If you had a device that could interact with the internet, you could get to this service. And that was the same thing with communications, right? There was digital, tel you know, the, you know, I remember, you know, AT&T would talk about, you know, digital cellular and digital, you know, digital telephone calls. What it meant is that they, they were going from like the analog copper stuff to a new infrastructure, but it wasn't over the public internet. It was Skype and WhatsApp and, you know, and, and WeChat and all these things that basically went over the top where all you needed was a smartphone, a piece of software, or a connection to the internet, and you would instantly create global communication. That's what stable coins represent in this world is over the top internet money where it's not locked in and closed down. It's running on the public internet. And it, it's sort of, you know, just like uh, digital, digital music, once it got truly in an open format on the internet was ubiquitous and, and people would never look back. They would never go back uh, to digital CDs, <laughs> you know, uh, using those analogies again. And eight tracks are antiques now. People collect them. So, uh, you know, you never know. Um, so people collect coins and notes too. Huh? I said people collect old coins and notes as well. They do. They do. You know what they actually collect too? Are those big arcade games, actually? Uh, those are actually yeah. appreciated. <laughs> yeah. um, if you want to really nerd out. Um, all right, guys. So help me connect something here. Um, so we're talking about the macro. We're talking about the dollar, which is an analog um, in this instance being transferred to something that's digital, that's really big. We're talking about a huge dynamic shift in how we think about money. Uh, and there's obviously a huge addressable market there. Um, the growth in stable coins this year has been huge, but that's from 6 billion to 20 billion, which when we're talking about on a global asset class, you know, asset class level is really tiny. So I think that this is kind of the, the promise of the future of what stable coins can be. Talk to me about what's actually driving growth today? Who are the people that are actually using stable coins? Yeah. I mean, I, I take the start of that and Pomp, I'm sure you've got perspective here too. Like, as I was sort of saying at the start, I mean, the first is, you know, st stable coins are the payment and settlement medium for digital asset markets. And so one is just anyone who participates in digital asset markets is participating in stable coins. So that's one very big use. A second is um, basically, you know, people who are who are borrowing and lending on the internet using new, you know, blockchain-based um, protocols for borrowing and lending. So essentially, these emerging credit and interest rate markets, um, people who are doing that are using stablecoins because once, if you want to do something on chain, if you want to do something in a smart contract that is a financial arrangement, like you're going to do that using a stablecoin because you have to. You, um, you're, you're not going to do that with a volatile commodity asset. Um, so, so that's a second big use. And then the third is, is just th this growing use in, in international, um, especially international uses. So whether it's dollarization, people who want to hold these, or it's international um, payment flows where businesses are, are realizing that they can make a dollar payment uh, between themselves and another partner or other over the internet with greater speed, speed and lower cost and without being subject to uh, the, the multiple hops from their local currency into an intermediary currency into another local currency. So we see that, for example, growing throughout Southeast Asia as a, as a use case in Latin America. So those are, those are emerging pieces. We're not yet at the place, though, where um, this is, uh, you know, kind of what I think of as like first party peer to peer payments or, 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 or in the West, uh, like person to merchant payments. I think that will be on the horizon in the not too distant future. 
Yeah, and I think the other piece that is really interesting to me is uh, I'm seeing a ton of investors start to realize the value to this, right? So um, th there's kind of, uh, if you look at a company like BlockFi, for example, they've really capitalized on this idea of, wait a second, if all of a sudden people want these stable coins and there's this imbalance between the supply and demand, right? If you think of what like a normal bank would do, there's trillions of dollars of deposits and they're turning around, they're lending that on the back end. Uh, there's a certain risk profile associated with it. And so you're going to earn your, you know, anywhere between hundred to 300 basis points of interest. They basically keep a majority and they give the, um, the, the depositor uh, some small percentage of, of that interest earned. If you look at something like what BlockFi basically did early on was they said, wait a second, everyone wants stable coins, but they don't necessarily want to just go convert hundred percent of their assets into those stable coins. And so what if we basically financially incentivize people to deposit more stable coins. And so what we're, where we've seen a huge um, increase in interest is literally investors looking at their portfolio saying, okay, I can basically go put this in a checking account, right? Earn three to five basis points. I can go into a money market account that maybe if I'm lucky, it'll get me 125 to 150 basis points, or I can go use one of these yield services that basically I can convert that five for 10% cash position I have in my portfolio to stable coins. And now I can earn, you know, block by case, 8.6%. Uh, other companies are kind of in the six to 10% range. You start to really say, wait a second, like that's a huge onboarding for uh, that investment class. Well, once they begin to actually earn yield on the stable coin in that manner, they then begin to say, well, what else can I do with these stable coins, right? And so it kind of becomes this like um, almost Trojan horse to get them to do everything else. Um, and, and it's just, you know, show me the incentives and I'll show you what, what the outcome is going to be, right? Yeah, I mean, this, this is this is exactly, you know, there are two two pieces I want to reinforce here. Like the birth of, of these internet native um, uh, lending markets um, is, is really profound. And some of that is machine intermediated by smart contracts. And some of that, the sort of CFI piece like BlockFi, uh, Genesis, others like firms that are basically institutionally lending um, and doing the risk management that you would think of in traditional institutional lending. Uh, and with, with borrowers that are getting a return on, on capital that's significant that they, you're seeing yields that are, again, they're in that, you know, Five, eight, 10, 12 percent, which is dramatic. Now those that, that, that yield curve will come in over time, but that's that's really significant. And so we are actually seeing for the first time, uh, you know effectively uh, institutions that would historically think about um, you know having uh, dollar funds or other currency funds in money markets saying, I, I would actually like to have um, participation in, in these uh, stablecoin based markets. And again, there's a, there's a kind of risk profile and people have to determine their appetite there of their total cash, what are they gonna do? Um, but that's pretty dramatic. And, and I think, you know, this is one of those moments in time that I think we're gonna look back on in a number of years where an internet based marketplace is radically more efficient at convening supply and demand whether that's coordinating creators of products on the shores of China to find end users in markets around the world through Amazon and Alibaba or, uh, or, or, or niche product creators that are finding audiences for their artistic goods through Etsy or pick your marketplace model. Internet marketplaces dominate and are far, far superior to the le legacy kind of offline systems. And I think we're seeing the birth of these, these internet financial marketplaces with stable coins being a really critical piece of that. And again, this gets to the total addressable market question where I think you were going, uh, Michael, which is the TAM, the total addressable market on this is, you know, how, how many dollars are stored in money markets? Uh, how many dollars are in uh, these sort of fixed income uh, type of, of uh, arrangements? It's trillions. And so the, the market size for fiat digital currency uh, like stable coins, is in the trillions. And so, like you said, you know, 20 billion sounds like a lot. The growth rate has been significant. I think the growth rate is gonna accelerate uh, as we go forward. We're looking at a world where we're moving from tens of billions to hundreds of billions that are in these, these uh, stable coins and fiat digital currencies in the coming years. And that's why, you know, um, regulators are obviously paying more attention and are setting some of the rules for the road because, you know, if, if this is going to be uh, an instrument that is kind of backed in the commercial banking system, you know, we've got to make sure it's done, it's done well. So sort of opaque offshore 
uh, unregulated uh, versions of this are probably going to come under a lot more scrutiny and, and, and regulated, um, you know, compliant versions are, are very likely going to be something that mainstream, whether financial institutions, individuals, or businesses will tend to rely on more. Yeah, absolutely. And, and one thing I want to drill in there actually is uh, I, I love that Charlie Munger phrase that you just said, Pop, you show me the incentives, I'll, I'll tell you the outcome. And uh, I think especially in, in crypto where there's so much innovation and, and kind of uh, technologists that people tend to describe, hey, this is why you should be interested in a product like this, or this is why it's better. But they don't, they kind of skip over what are the economics and the incentives that's actually going to drive the adoption and the analogy. So we just did a, a webinar earlier with uh, Rick Edelman. We were talking about RIAs and how do they get involved in the space? And he was like, well, look, the one thing that no one's talking about is if an RIA allocates the Bitcoin, they're not getting paid on it because the brokerages and the custodians that they use, that the amount that they're allocating isn't going to be included in their AUM, which is how they get fees. So this is a long-winded way of saying there need, we need to align incentives here, I think, to um, you know, drive adoption. So Pom, I mean, you're, you're very involved in kind of investment circles. You just brought up the example of BlockFi. How, what does the economic engine look, look like that's actually going to drive different actors to get involved in this ecosystem? Well, I think there's there's two pieces to this, right? One is they're running from something, and then the other is that they're running to something. And so the running from something is, um, you know, almost every asset available today, depending on how you count, has a negative real rate of return, right? If you look across stocks, bonds, um, you know, it's just, it's really, really bad. And so I think that um, if you look and say, okay, that's not good. Well, one thing you can do is you can take those assets and you can put them into a new technology form factor and start to actually get higher rates of return, right? If, if you kind of go back to, um, I always use the example of, um, there, there's three uh, periods of time, right? So I, I talk about it as like the analog age of securities, the electronic age, and then this digital age that's coming. But um, if you think of all of the people who are trading physical stock certificates and literally open outcry method on the stock exchange floor, um, you know, kind of pre 1980s, there was a certain return profile. Well, the first guys who said, wait a second, why don't we just execute these trades via the computer? They're still trading the same asset. But the return profile that they could drive was so much greater. And eventually the financial incentive pulled everybody into that age, right? And so they were still trading the same asset, new technology form factor. Well, what I think is going to happen now is we're going to go from trading those electronic QCIPs, right? Which really ends up being pretty much every asset in the world is, are just these electronic QCIPs to some digital uh, version of them, right? So a new technology form factor, the people who are early to that trend will get a higher rate of return and it'll commoditize down as more competition. That's what you're seeing with uh, stable coins. That's kind of what we we're just talking about. It's like, if I take a dollar right now and I put it into the legacy system and I earn three to five basis points in a checking account, uh, but I can also take that same dollar, convert it to a new technology form factor and go earn 8.6% APY. So it's, a, it's not even a question of where, what I'm going to do, right? As long as I can get comfortable with um, I'm doing that. And so I think that the other piece here that you're going to see is you're going to start to see people say, okay, what else can I use this digital dollar, right? Or the stable coin for in whether it's treasury management payments, right? You can just go exactly. down the line. Exactly. Everyone is going to be financially incentivized to do this. And so a, a, a very simple equation is take a multinational corporation, right? How much money do they spend on fees of moving their own money around the world? Some companies, right? They're really, really good at it. And they may spend a million bucks. Some may spend hundreds of thousands, but there's some companies that spend $50 million a year, yeah. right? And so if all of a sudden you can just take out that line item from an expense standpoint by simply moving your money around the world in a new technology form factor, you are very heavily financially incentivized to go do this. And so to me, it's, you know, I, I always look at like, where are we today? And where's like the finish line? Like, where are we going? All of the in-between, which platform, you know, what's the sequence of events, all that's up for debate, but like, it's a foregone conclusion yeah. of where we're going at this point. And I think that's the most important pe thing people have to understand. And then like, go do yeah. your research and try to figure out kind of all the in-between steps, but, but understanding that foregone conclusion is important. We're, I mean, what's what, I'm totally on the same page, and, and like we're, we're betting our company, obviously, on on, on that happening. Um, but but you know, I think like we we see a world where, uh, you know, effectively, you know, what what corporations traditionally do is they rely on like payments bank, payments banking, transaction banking, et cetera, to kind of manage all those things. That's what we think cor corporations and businesses, anyone conducting commerce, anyone who interacts globally, anyone who's an internet business, they're going to move to this because it's superior. 
They're going to move to this to store value. They're going to move to this to transact value. They're going to move to this because they're able to actually automate interactions in their, in their supply chain with greater assurance, reliability, transparency, audibility, all these different things. It's just a far superior uh, base infrastructure for what, what you think of as treasury, what you think of as what, what businesses do. And, and um, we're seeing those use cases sprout up all over the place. Like every day we have companies signing up for a circle business account and, and they're literally like, I want to use, I want to use this for all these different types of treasury and payment use cases. It's, it's really interesting. We're seeing venture funds who are saying, I want to use this as for, for fun, for, for making investments um, globally um, and entrepreneurs who want to take stable coins uh, and, and hold them. And obviously the blockchain ecosystem, that's going to be more, more common. And people are realizing like, I, if I hold my treasury with this and I have, you know, working capital and I can have that in a open term uh, yield, you know, environment that is a lot better than uh, than your your Chase bank account, business bank account. So, you know, there, there are these really interesting things. I, I want to kind of kind of hone in on one thing, though, which is, you know, the fundamental infrastructure that that is emerging here is so powerful. I mean, um, as you know, we we've, we've been um, uh, through Center Consortium uh, established a framework for doing multi-chain uh, USDC. And so there's a lot of competition right now in these layer one blockchains. Um, and, and there's competition for a lot of different dimensions of how blockchains will be used. But one of those is, you know, for, you know, kind of payments and settlement. Um, if you want to move the traffic of a PayPal or, you know, the, or, or the traffic of, of, a, of a major commerce player to the internet, you need, or you want to move capital market functions like trading uh, in traditional capital markets to this infrastructure, you, you, you need orders of magnitude more scaling. And so we're now seeing like, um, you know, we, we launched USDC for Algorand, which has, you know, a, a thousand plus transactions per second and, and seconds to settlement finality. Last week, we launched USDC for Solana, which, you know, effectively can support up to 50,000 transactions per second. USDC can settle in 350 milliseconds with settlement finality at one fiftieth of a penny transaction cost. And this is, this is really astounding. And so this is like when broadband opened up, the pipes opened up and then people could build apps for those pipes that, that changed the way we experience the internet. This is what's happening now. We're opening up these pipes uh, that are much bigger and can support much broader, bigger applications. And now we can really start to bring the mainstream of, of, of financial activity onto this kind of infrastructure. You know, it's funny, Jim, I, I'm, I'm not sure people know this about you on this call, but you, uh, you know, were a pioneer in the internet business. So when you're talking about broadband and the pipes opening up, you're actually there. Do you ever just feel like, guys, <laughs> we've done this before. We yeah. went through the internet. I was telling you then, and I'm telling you now, because, you know, even if you look at, you know, the genesis of Circle, you guys started in 2013, right? Yeah. You've kind of gone through a whole bunch of different businesses. I mean, how do both of you, I mean, to Jeremy and then to Palm, how do you guys, what's the most effective way to talk about this to people and indoctrinate people? Because I think all of us who are operating in this space are like, look, we need to just grow the pie. This is really early days. Um, how do you just talk to people about what you're doing here in a way that they can understand? Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny is uh, a lot of the ideas that we would talk about seven years ago um, uh, uh, for what we thought would become possible with digital currency um, it's actually all happening now. So, it, it, you know, and what's interesting is back then uh, when, when we were founding the company, you know, we told our, in, our first investors and we told our, our earliest employees, like, you know, this is, this is what we think is going to happen. And we think it's going to take five to 10 years to get to that place. So we're right at seven. We're like, right. We're kind of right on schedule um, for a lot of those things. And, you know, I think the, the way we would talk about it then and the way I talk about it now, just uh, for a lay person is, you know, all of these things that we've come to experience with the internet, which is the ability to um, share information with anyone anywhere instantly at no cost, the ability to access all the world's knowledge in milliseconds at no cost, the ability to communicate effortlessly uh, on a peer-to-peer -peer basis with, in, in video and other ways to access the celestial, celestial jukebox of, of every of song ever played uh, and, tr and transact globally. All of these things that have happened in media, in, in communications, in retail, that's all happening to money now. 
And that's, uh, we're gonna enter a world where moving value around is gonna just be a ubiquitous free service, just like moving data and content and, and communications is. And furthermore, um, that money, that new money that is gonna exist on the internet is gonna become uh, uh, programmable in, in the ways that apps have been able to program content and data and, and enrich our lives in really powerful ways, that's gonna happen with money as well. And that, that second part, it's harder for people to kind of grok and connect to because it's like, well, what, what does that mean? Um, I don't actually think we know the answer, but I think that in five years, we're gonna have gone through a super cycle of entrepreneurial innovation uh, of developers who are building on this infrastructure, who are gonna create use cases for money that never existed before. Uh, and that's exciting. That's really exciting. Punk, what do you think? How do you, how do you uh, talk to people about this? I mean, you're, you know, you do it all the time. <laughs> I, I just try to find common ground for them, right? Like it, it, it's one of these things where um, if I'm talking to an individual, it's very different than an institution. Um, so I take like an institutional investor, uh, ultimately what they are trying to decide is um, kind of the macro and micro at the same time, right? They've got to understand the macro environment and understand kind of asset allocation. Um, and a lot of the things in the crypto world are backwards compared to the legacy world. And so that takes a lot of education. So for example, um, you know, the idea of uh, th there's one of the top five hedge funds in the world. Here, here's a perfect example. One of the top five hedge funds in the world called me recently and they said, hey, we want to uh, go ahead and we, we want to uh, uh, start playing in this space. And what they want to do is uh, very, very focused on risk management. And so like they need strategies that they can trade in size that don't have a lot of volatility to them, like all these like parameters. And it was on a day where Bitcoin was down like 5%. I was like, literally, like, look today, like, like your entire strategy would have been invalidated from a risk management standpoint on a day like today. And so there, there's things like that, that I think are uh, one, just kind of holistically looking at it, but ultimately it comes down to, again, like, what are they trying to accomplish? And that's what I mean by like find common ground. So if you think of, um, you know, I've had the conversation with public pensions, for example, where it's like, Hey, you've got a pretty big cash position. You guys have a very specific view on the world rather than sit in that cash position and kind of just eat that devaluation, go ahead and look at this new technology form factor. And when you start to put it into like, here's what it can do for you. I think people just, they can wrap their heads around it. Cause when you walk in and you're like, you know, I don't know, here's how a blockchain works. They're like, wait, slow down. Like what yeah. the hell is a blockchain? Why do I need a blockchain? Like, you know, like you, you go down this like very weird world uh, and their eyes kind of glaze over and they're like, Hey, I'm worried about what the price of timber is. I wonder, worried about why like central banks are selling gold right now. Uh, the stock market is like on steroids, then it's dropped. Like they've got so much stuff going through their head that they don't have time to like go really, really deep down a rabbit hole. Instead where you've almost have to start at is like, here is what this can do for you. And when they're like, oh, okay, that's what I need. Then they're like, well, why does it do that? And then you kind of like work backwards in the conversation. Um, and it's just people coming out of the crypto world. Like we spend all day talking about this stuff. Um, so we forget that like other people literally have no clue what's going on. And the test I'll, I'll leave everyone with is like, go ask your friends and family right now what the price of Bitcoin is. There are a lot of people who think Bitcoin is at $3,000. Right? <laughs> right? It's just like they heard that it went to a lot and they heard it crashed a lot. And like, that's it. And so like, you just have to remember that, you know, there's like a hundred million people. Uh, I think that is the latest numbers I've seen, like a hundred million or so that are in crypto in general out of seven plus billion people in the world. Like a lot of people in finance still don't understand this stuff. And you just got to kind of walk them through what can it do for you? Yeah, absolutely. So to, to kind of close this out and we're nearing the, the portion here of audience questions. So people who are on, you can see there are a couple questions, but um, now's your time to ask uh, Jeremy and Pump anything. Uh, anything that's on your mind. Uh, so I guess what I'll close this out is, um, so, you know, one of my takeaways here is that when you're talking about stable coins, you're just talking about the next digital evolution of money. The advantages seem extremely obvious. Uh, I think one of the big barriers that people like to bring up is, well, wait a second, what about the incumbents? Because in this case, the incumbents are the government and, you know, control of distribution of currency is one of the most important controls that they have over people. And Actually, what I what I might genu uh, you know gently push back on what both you guys are saying is if you look at uh, the principal uh, stablecoin, which is Tether, you can make a lot of arguments that that's actually being used to evade capital controls in China, right? So, I guess how do you see stablecoins 
interacting with government issued currency and I guess potentially even uh, central bank uh, issued digital currencies. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a few things to break down there. I mean, I, I think first, um, you know, as a as a first principle, when when we got together with Coinbase and launched USDC, it was really with the premise that um, you know digital dollar stable coins um, ought to be done in a compliant, ought to be issued in a compliant, regulated fashion, uh, where there's you know uh, transparency auditability where the, the Bank Secrecy Act and AML rules that apply to financial institutions apply to, to you know, the, the issuance uh, and, and entities that interact with stablecoin issuers um, and that it, it's done under the existing payments banking kind of legal framework. And, and that was really important. And I think we obviously knew that over time, um, there'd be more rules that would come up because this is such a powerful payment system innovation. We're starting to see that. We're seeing rules for how the banking sector can uh, participate in these arrangements, hold reserves for them. I expect that we'll probably very likely see regulations uh, that emerge uh, based on the G20 rules that have just come out around, around global stable coins that, that have to do with how the entire financial sector interacts with this infrastructure. And so I think the first is um, the, the mainstream adoption of these is going to be done in collaboration with governments, and that's critical. Um, this is not this. This cannot be a, a breakthrough innovation for mainstream uh, financial markets, commerce, payments, and, and so on. If the the concept is this is just a way to evade government control, and I think that the stable coins that are designed um, around that premise um, are, are very likely to uh, to feel more of a squeeze uh, over time. Um, now, I, I think that there are big questions though here, and and I think one is as a, a full reserve digital dollar stable coin, there's actually you know, direct alignment with what the, say the central bank of the United States cares about it. This is not changing the monetary policy of the United States, it's inheriting the monetary policy. And we can, we can debate uh, you know, whether that's a, a good policy or a bad policy. And, and I am uh, for, you know, for, for all it's worth, um, you know, deep, deep conviction that non-sovereign stores of value, digital stores of value like Bitcoin have enormous value because of monetary policy issues that exist in the world um, and, and the importance of those. But nonetheless, with, with stable coins, there's alignment there. Now, the bigger issue is um, you have a breakthrough and we were talking about it earlier where you know, these, these digital currencies go over the internet. And that changes things in that, you know, effectively in that world um, anyone with a smartphone uh, will be able to vote with their smartphone what economic system they participate in, just like they can participate in uh, Twitter or, or uh, Facebook or WhatsApp, uh, wherever they are in the world and connect and in communications and culture, despite where they live, despite their government. Um, that doesn't mean there aren't going to be government rules, but it's a, it's a force uh, in society that I think will, will take place. And it does raise significant long-term questions around uh, the adoption of uh, you know, leading reserve currencies as, uh, as primary currencies in more economic activity. We already have dollarization as an example. Obviously the rise of the Chinese yuan is gonna be very significant as more people trade with China and, and directly settle transactions with digital currency with China. But it, it does raise questions over time for, for many countries, um, you know, does, this, does this accelerate the role of reserve currencies in domestic economies? Um, or, you know, how, does that, how does that play out? And those are big questions and they're unanswered questions right now. Pump anything out there? I think Jeremy nailed it. Perfect. Very few um, times do I have nothing to add, but that was one of the. <laughs> nailed it. Um, all right, great. Uh, so one question um, that I'll ha I have for both you guys, Pump, I know you're a Bitcoin guy, but I saw you tweeting uh, about DeFi the other day. So I'll actually turn this one over to you first. Um, how do stable coins, how are they used currently in the, in the DeFi ecosystem and how do they kind of power or enable or impact that, that ecosystem in general? Yeah, I, I think that there's a couple things. So I always start this conversation off with uh, anyone who is interested in 
Bitcoin, crypto, all of kind of this entire industry, I think generally agrees on this idea that decentralized financial applications are going to be one, really important, two, super pervasive, and three, they are going to unlock immense value for people at the highest levels of socioeconomic status, all the way down to the people at the lowest level. Um, I I think the big kind of, I don't know, cautious optimism that I've had is that those decentralized financial applications are getting close to being launched and, and created. And so as I've done more and more work on it, I, I, I'm actually not convinced that most of the current iterations uh, are going to be sustainable, right? If you kind of go back and you look at something like uh, you know, the 1990s, late 1990s with the internet, pretty much every idea that was tried then ended up being correct about a decade later. So everything from music streaming, file sharing, food delivery, like, I mean, you just can go down the line of all of these like great quote unquote failures in the 99, uh, 2000 stock uh, market bubble and things like that, but they actually were the right idea just too early. And so I think that's kind of one thing that I'm starting to see um, because ultimately what you need is you need the infrastructure to get built, right? And so things like Bitcoin, like stable coins, like these are the, the core ingredients for those things to work. And so we're, we're still innovating there. We're still kind of building those things. I think that's the first part. The second part is that there's a lot of people who uh, were just participating in the ICO world and, and kind of all of that. They've basically just figured out a new way to do ICOs, right? And it's a little bit less obvious, but they're essentially creating these token-based systems. They're calling it decentralized financial applications. The problem is the platforms aren't actually decentralized. And two, all this yield farming and all this kind of stuff is just the use of these tokens that are created at thin air and they're just being dumped on people. And so I I just think that there's a lot of kind of cleaning out that needs to happen in in terms of that. But I have this deep seated belief that like the decentralized financial applications are going to occur. Now, when that happens, I personally have this thesis that every single currency in the world is going to be uh, digitized, right? And the reason why that's important is it doesn't matter if it happens from the private sector or from governments. Just every currency is going to be digitized. So there will be a digital dollar, there will be digital yuan, digital yen, you know, um, Bitcoin, every single currency will be digitized. And when you start to actually um, kind of get a level playing field on the currency's technology, the competition now plays out at the monetary policy layer. And so when that happens, the, the switching cost is so low from one currency to another. So when Jeremy and his team is digitizing that dollar and they're creating this dollar-backed stable coin, the reason why that's important is because actually if the US dollar is the best monetary policy available, what it should do is it should suck all the other people in who have digital currencies that have different monetary policies. And so we've never had a world where the switching cost was low or the friction was reduced going from currency to currency, right? I always joke and say like, the easiest way for most people to switch currencies is to go to like the airport and use one of the currency converters. And they basically take like 50% of your money. Right. And so like when you get into a world where, again, I just have an internet connection, I can go in my digital wallet and I can quickly go from a digital dollar to a digital Euro to a yen to whatever it opens up the possibilities of what people can do. And it allows for a more free market type of competition. So I think that's like a very key piece when we get that digital currency, you then can go build all of these decentralized applications. And, and, you know, we're already seeing it. I think Jeremy was talking about it earlier, like how popular the stable coins already are. So even with things that I personally don't believe will be super sustainable in the long term in some of these decentralized financial applications, people are still like salivating over the fact of using a digital fiat currency. And so I think that it's just a signal of as the decentralized financial applications get more mature and grow and become sustainable, you're just going to see demand continue to increase. Like if you were to write out a list of all the reasons why demand is going to increase and then write a list of all the reasons why demand is going to decrease, it's so lopsided. Like (laughs) there's almost nothing on the list of like why demand should decrease for these stable coins and the list for why they should increase is literally pages and pages long. And so I think that it's just kind of, again, it's a foregone conclusion that every currency is going to be digitized. How we get there is up for debate. That's fine. But when you switch your mindset to every currency is going to be digitized, you start to understand like the work Jeremy's doing and others, somebody has to do it. And if we wait around for governments to do it, like, you know, good, good luck. That might take a while. They're still trying to build Fed now, right? Like, And ge- generally when people give the, 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 the negative reasons why it wouldn't grow, it's generally because it's a problem for incumbents. 
Uh, and you know, if you took that bet over the last 30 years in the internet space, you would not be a very happy wagerer. Uh, and so I, I, I know which bet uh, I would be taking uh, off right now. Um, but I, I just to, to, to your question, Michael, and I, I know we're coming up on time here, but I think um, with DeFi specifically, you know, USDC, just as an example, it is the preeminent, uh, you know, stablecoin used in DeFi applications. Um, even DAI, which is itself a, a maker and, and DAI, like I, I think the majority of the of the uh, uh, collateral behind DAI is actually USDC. So USDC plays a, a very big role in in that ecosystem, and, and I agree with with Pomp that there is um, there are dimensions of that which which are, are, are obviously not sustainable or are not delivering inherent value. I think the what what is interesting is. These are building blocks and people talk about composability. We're, we're seeing building blocks such as order matching engines, the management of liquidity, borrowing and lending protocols. We're seeing all of these building blocks, which are basically the building blocks of capital markets. And those building blocks are being built on chain and then developers can compose with those and integrate those and utilize those. That's very real and very, very powerful. And you know something like a yield market which is effectively, there are people who want to borrow and there are people who want to, uh, to, to lend, that those, those, those counterparties can meet uh, in a marketplace that is conducted in software entirely on the internet in an open, transparent way where all the risk management is public and audited and where it, you know, that is a, a digital market that is actually running in code uh, that is not run by a company, it's run by software. That's pretty profound. And, um, and, and the value there is that, you know, effectively borrowing and lending as an internet native market is now emerging. And that, that, is, that is absolutely gonna grow. Um, that, that should theoretically grow uh, to, as we talked about earlier, in, into the hundreds of billions of dollars of value uh, over time. I guess this is the, this last question here, it's a little bit more uh, technical. Jeremy, I, I feel like I know your answer already, but I'll, I'll ask it. For financial advisors managing client capital, are there any compliant tools slash platforms to look at to custody USDC. Cash positions are growing in client accounts and it's becoming more and more difficult to charge an advisor's fee when dollar purchasing power is going down and bond yields are ugly. So any uh, kind of going into what you were saying before, but any any thoughts or answers on that? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, you're, you're seeing a lot of different uh, different things here. I mean, obviously there are, um, there are digital asset custodians that are regulated custodians that all support USDC and, and, and that's not yield generating, but more and more of these platforms are attaching to these yield platforms like a BlockFi as an example. And so there, there are you know, mechanisms for that cash to get put to work, so to speak, um, and, and generate value. Um, and you know, that, that's something that you know, Circle's also working on um, and, and sees you know, tremendous value. And, and we, we think that the sort of institutional segment is, an, is a really interesting segment um, where you know, people are going to want to tokenize into USDC, put it into these different lending markets, uh, generate uh, yield and returns. And um, you know, I think creating a business model that works for, for RIAs is, is a pretty important one. Um, and, uh, and I think, as you had mentioned earlier, Michael, I mean, I, I think that is a missing link here, you know, creating the incentives uh, that work for, for people who manage money um, and, and, uh, and making it easier for, for them to participate in this, whether it's getting exposure to Bitcoin uh, or it's getting exposure to these new, you know, digital dollar markets. Um, I think both uh, there, you, you will see more and more products that, that RIAs can take advantage of uh, as we go forward. Awesome. Well, guys, uh, unfortunately, that's uh, that's all the time that we have here. Uh, Jeremy and Palm, for those who want to connect with you, find out more, what's what's the best way that they can do that? I'm on Twitter, uh, uh, Jer, uh, Jer Lair and um, uh, and Circle.com. So, yeah. Okay. Palm, are you on Twitter? Do you have a Twitter? <laughs> <laughs> I think, what's that? That's what actually how I feel about like TikTok and stuff. I got no clue about any of that other stuff. I got a Twitter account. <laughs> Nice. Um, all right, guys. Uh, that Look, this has been such a fun conversation. Palm, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, Jeremy and the folks at Circle, this has been a blast. Again, guys, this whole thing was made possible by Circle. Uh, hopefully now you have a much better understanding of what they do if you didn't already know. Uh, but if you want to connect uh, con directly with the Circle guys, please reach out to, to me and Julie uh, or go check out their website at www.circle.com. So guys, thank you so much. Uh, if you found this interesting, actually, and if you didn't get enough of Jeremy, 
Uh, our next webinar is on November 17th, and we're going to be uh, joined again by Jeremy uh, and the St CEO of Algorand, Steve Kokinos. So uh, we hope to see you all then. And uh, gentlemen, thank you so much again for, for doing this. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, guys. Appreciate it. Had fun.